Okay, now let's see if we are more or less live. Ha! Success. Wildly out of sync with what I'm seeing, but still success. Okay. Okay, one more thing, just checking here. Okay, that one's there. Okay. Okay, um, I am not quite in sync, where am I? Oh, buggery. Now it's lost. Okay, it's going to make me go to the Facebook page, I guess, to see chat. Yeah, is it? Boy. All right, I'm going to have to do it on my page. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I've got comments on my page. Um, the page is also wildly out of sync with what is going on live, but that's okay. Hello, good evening, everybody. Nice to see you, those of you who have come to visit me. Um, I am currently uh, doing it in a whole different way, um, which, uh, although still the same basic premise, which means I am going to be a little confused at times. Um, for one thing, I'm not used to getting the comments uh, or the chat comments or whatever you want to call it here on Facebook, which is always bad with comments anyway, um, there, and it's just made the comments go away, which I do not want. Um, anyway, I, so I'm going to be struggling with the comments tonight, so please don't, uh, don't freak out. I'm still, still here. Um, as far as I know, everything is going fine um, with the broadcast, except I don't seem to be able to link to uh, Twitter to this particular um, broadcast. I don't know why. I'm completely confused as usual. Anyway, um, so it's giving me comment. It's telling me I've got comments, but it won't show me the bloody comments. It's only showing me like the first four comments. So uh, it'll take me a while to figure it out, and I may not be able to figure it out while I am online um, with you guys. So I won't worry about it too much tonight. I do see that uh, Isaac has checked in. Hello, Isaac. Tim has checked in. Hello, Tim. Good to see you there. Now my comments are disappearing again. Angie just said hi. Hi, Angie. Jennifer. There's Jennifer. Kristen. There's Kristen. Um, Soren I saw briefly before it flicked away. As usual, the comments are really weird on um, Facebook, so I have no idea why I can't just look at the comments. I know there's supposed to be adjustments, but anyway. Uh, Angie, hello. Good to see you, too. Um, it's deep and it's real. Amen. Um, okay, so yeah, it's extremely confusing to me trying to 
go to the comments. I don't know why I have no comments on this page. I should have comments. Where are my comments? Uh, oh, well. Um, nah, they're not there, not there, not there. I'll figure it out some other time. The problem is, of course, is I have to go live every time I want to figure something out, and that makes it very difficult. Anyway, first off the bat, um, I am going to dedicate this particular reading to the poor 1 a.m. crowd who will be seeing this probably those who will see this will see this as a recorded version either on YouTube or here on the site um, so they have had the hardest uh, the hardest road to hoe because um, it's every time it's when I come back to this that things have happened I'm not sure what happened this time I suspect it was something to do with like my system download uh, my you know computer downloaded a new system software or something um, may have downloaded a new software uh, sorry, a new Facebook. I can't tell, although it does seem to be slightly different than it was before. And as a result, I lost the connection I had set up between my streaming software and Facebook. I don't know. That's just a guess. I'm having to do it a slightly different way, though. So just so you understand, um, things are a trifle tentative, and I'm going to keep it as simple as possible until I get a better grip on how I've made this work. Because <laughs> I'm not 100% certain. I mean, I've, I've gone through the standard Facebook procedure to, to do a live broadcast, which I hadn't had to do before. I could go straight through my streaming software. But enough about that. Who cares? Uh, the whole point is that our technology is supposed to be invisible. That's, you know, we're in the age of information. We, we use computers so much now. They're in everything we own. Um, and uh, it's supposed to be seamless and invisible, which, of course, is a, a load of crap. Um, it always is. As soon as they tell you that, you know, techno a technology has matured, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. It hasn't. Um, some of them never will. Some of them will only become mature uh, years and years after they tell you that it is. Um, this is clearly one of them. I don't know anybody who doesn't occasionally have problems with their streaming setup, and I certainly don't know anybody who doesn't occasionally have problems with social media um, and its various censorships and, and uh, deregulations or whatever it's called when you get kicked off of YouTube for improperly citing something you shouldn't, they feel, or whatever. Anyway, but my essential thing is just I'm trying to make this work and have it be as easy as possible. So I, again, I will apologize for not being able to properly say hello to everybody tonight. Um, I see various people checking in to say hello, Pamela, Christy, Chris, hi, good to see you all. Julian or Julian, um, depending on where you're checking in from, Julian. Um, thank you so much for the kind comments about other land. Um, it's also very disconcerting because, of course, my Facebook page is like three or four minutes behind what I'm actually doing in real life. So I have to look at that on my streaming software just to notice in case, you know, I don't know, I suddenly start developing a weird lesion on my face or something, you know, and have to make an emergency trip to uh, the hospital. I, I, that's not likely to happen. I honestly don't know why I said that. I don't want you guys going, oh my God, does Tad have lesions on his head? No, this is my face. <laughs> I can't help it. This is just how it looks. Oh, and you're wondering about my shirt. I'm wearing this in honor of our dear friend Cindy, who we lost two years ago. Uh, Cindy, we, this was a joke um, with various people on the tadwilliams.com message board when I started. God, this is a long time ago now. When I started The Witchwood Crown and this new Austin Art series, I said, hey, and this time maybe I'm going to put some Norn porn in it. Um, or I said something to that effect. And anyway, it became a kind of a, an online thing among the very tiny, select, but perfectly formed group of Tad Williams readers. Um, and uh, so eventually Cindy and some of the others, including my wife Deborah, figured, you know, there should be shirts. So the first one they made for me was a gorgeous thing with, with rhinestones. Um, and, uh, or not rhinestones, but... Um, kind of sequiny things anyway little little silvery things um i'm not sure where that one is i suspect my wife has taken that away because it's the fanciest looking one but these are the ones that we did i think for the merch the merch offering um so i'm wearing it tonight because i've been thinking about 
our friend Cindy, and uh, who is a great loss to the world, but especially to our particular community. So what else is there to tell you? Um, we're here, power is on, hooray. We have water, double hooray. Um, Johnny had a fairly miserable day because <laughs> we had a big downpour, and as you have grasped by now, Johnny is uh, deeply, deeply rain and noise phobic, poor guy. Um, but uh, eventually I threw a couple of uh, cannabis dog treats at him and strapped him up in his thunder coat and he was a little better and he was able to nap on the bed with me for a while. I didn't get to nap because he was so nervous, but we had a little time to hang out and he was doing better and then dinner time arrived and that always perks him up. So um, we're still in the middle of the atmospheric river here in California, which I'm sure many of you know that already and have experienced it personally, or you have been in atmospheric rivers of your own in other parts of the world, um, or some kind of climate mess, which of course is going on all over. Um, speaking of, of course, one of the great stories in the news this week was, they're talking about the uh, executives at Exxon, huge, petroleum company, um, biggest in the world for a long time. I don't know what its status is now. And it said that as early as the 1970s that they were aware of climate change and that the science that they themselves paid for came back and said, yes, this is going to happen. Anthropogenic climate change, et cetera, et cetera. So they knew about this stuff back in the 70s, and yet there are still lobbying groups trying to tell us that climate change is not real. I mean, you know, meanwhile, we're breaking records all over the place, left and right. Um, you know, hottest temperatures ever, unusual sweeps of, of storm and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, not going to go into the politics of it, but it is just absolutely mind-numbing and infuriating to have it confirmed what we already suspected or what had been suggested several times, which is that the people who were most loudly denying this stuff actually knew about it years before Al Gore ever opened his mouth to say, uh, excuse me, climate change is going to be a problem or global warming or whatever it was being referred to at the time, as if that matters. The facts are the facts. The facts were there. Anyway, I'm saying this because I'm bloody sick of being stuck in the house with a nervous dog, but... Also because, of course, you know, I worry about the kind of world that my kids and your kids and their kids are all going to inherit. So anyway, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about that. It's just been on my mind because we've been listening to the rain pound on the roof all day and watching Johnny white eyeing, which, oh, reminds me of something else before I start reading. Um, I had always said, it was always amusing to me how much Johnny, when he was worried about things or not quite trusting a situation. This is our big dog, if you're new to this, our big dog, Johnny. How much he looked like a whale, because he would sort of lie there and give me this side eye, this very sad, sad side eye um, about things. And I would joke about it, say he, you know, that he, he did, he looked like a whale. Anyway, I found out this last week that in fact, Whale eye is an actual term people use to describe when dogs give you a certain kind of look, showing a lot of white in their eye, and it often means that they are unsettled, um, disturbed, worried, etc. So, you know, this was this was not uh, I was not as clever as I thought I was, and having noted this, this is a, a an idea that already exists. So, whale eye is what it's called when dogs give you an eye a look with a lot of eye white in it. Anything else I wanted to talk about? I'm almost done. I'm about to send out the next chunk of uh, Navigator's Children to the people who are reading for me. Um, probably be, be able to do that maybe tomorrow. Um, Deborah is reading the manuscript and she's saying nice things about it, which is helpful because Deb doesn't lie. Um, not only was she a publisher for a long, long time and a damn good one, but uh, she also knows the last thing I would want her to do was to say nice things about something of mine if she didn't mean them because that would be bad for our business. So uh, that's a hopeful sign for me that uh, in the midst of probably the most complicated book I have ever written, certainly one of the most difficult times in which I've ever written a book, interestingly enough, 
only matched by what was going on in my life during To Green Angel Tower, another Ostinard finishing volume that also got to be too long. Um, but uh, so it's it's a relief for me to have somebody who's who's whose uh, reactions I trust tell me looks good so far. Um, and I'm waiting for the reactions to come in from the other readers who, by the way, if I know some of you are probably listening out there, those those few, those brave, those stalwart souls um, do not tell me it's good if it's not or you know, keep doing what you're doing. Tell me what you don't like or what doesn't work or what worries you or what seems to violate the canon. Okay? Okay. I just wanted to make that clear. I only want uh, honest, just ver uh, honest, I've just gone blank on the word. I only want honest reactions. Um, and I would much rather have an honest reaction that says fix this than a polite, kind reaction that says, oh, it's okay. Or that part, yeah, no, it's fine. I, I always want to know. And that includes feedback from readers, but not today. <laughs> not today because, as I said, I've got all of these, all of these uh, uh, comments coming in, but they're coming in on Facebook, and I'm on my software so that I can at least see what's going on and what it looks like. Anyway, so... With all that said, my dad is settled in. Just to give you guys the family update, my dad is settled in, and they have finally taken off the COVID curfew. So I just talked to him this afternoon on the phone. He says, yes, they're going to meals um, and uh, getting together and, and able to socialize together in the place where he is now living. And uh, he was just going to dinner. In fact, I think he was trying to get me off the phone. So, which, you know, is a lesson that we've probably all had at some time in our life when someone w that we're worrying about and concerned about and we give them the gift of our time and they're like, oh, yes, it's lovely to hear from you, but actually I have to go do something. So um, I'm hoping dad's, dad's desire to get off to the dining room was not simply wanting to get away from me, but was also... Um, and looking forward to getting something to eat and getting to hang with his new housemates. That's a lot bigger than a house. I don't know what you'd call it. Anyway, okay, so is there anything else? And young Walter, who's actually old Walter, the Chihuahua is still absolutely mad, um, but that's nothing new, so we won't call that news. Um, there's all kinds of other crap. We're having a crappy year in so many ways here, but I'm not going to bore any of you with it because it just is what it is and we'll get through it and we'll deal with it. And one of the ways that uh, I get through things and deal with them is by A, working and B, having um, contact with readers. And that's what this is. And even though I won't be able to read the comments tonight while I'm doing stuff the way I normally could because I haven't figured out yet why all of a sudden I'm not able to get my own thing anymore in real time. Um, even though I can't do that tonight, I will read the comments later. So if you have something to tell me, just go ahead and leave it in the comments and I will, I will machete my way through the thicket of weird Facebook commentary because Facebook's really weird about comments trying to get you to, trying to maximize, I guess, how you use it in some way beneficial to Facebook, meta. Um, but nonetheless, it makes it really irritating trying to read comments. But I will, since I can't see them real time tonight. So anyway, I am going to read. And I am going to read, there and I've just, on my feed anyway, I've just dropped out of focus for no good reason. I moved, but only slightly. Um, anyway, it'll, it'll click back in. It always does, but I'm going to read. Okay, so chapter 38 is what we are reading tonight called Songs of the Eldest. Uh, anything you need to know from last... Well, you guys actually heard the last time I read, since I couldn't read last night. So if you're up to date, then you're up to date with me. 38, Songs of the Eldest. Darnoth woke in chill darkness, sweating. The wind hissed and wailed outside, clawing at the shuttered windows like a flight of the lonely dead. His heart leaped as he saw the dark shape looming over him, silhouetted by the embers in the fireplace. Captain! It was one of the men, voice a panicked whisper. There's somebody, there's someone coming down on the gate. 
armed men. God's tree, he cursed, struggling into his boots. Shrugging his mail shirt over his head, he snatched up his scabbard and helmet and followed the soldier out. Four more men were huddled on the top platform of the gatehouse, hunkered down behind the rampart. The wind pushed him, staggering, and he quickly dropped into a crouch. There, Captain! It was the one who had awakened him. Coming up the road through the town! He leaned past Dareneth to point. The moonlight, shining through the streaming clouds, silvered the shabby thatching of Naglaman Town's huddled roofs. There was indeed movement on the road, a small company of horsemen, perhaps a dozen in number. The men on the gatehouse watched the riders' slow approach. One of the soldiers groaned quietly. Dernoth, too, felt the ache of waiting. It was better when the horns were shrilling and the field was full of shouting. It is this waiting that has unmanned us all, Dernoth thought. Once we have been blooded again, our Naglamunders will do proudly. There must be more a hiding, one of the soldiers breathed. What should we do? Even with the crying of the wind, his voice seemed loud. How could the approaching riders not hear? Nothing, Dernal said firmly. Wait. The waiting seemed to last days. As the horsemen drew nearer, the moon picked out shining spear points and the gleam of helmets. The silent riders reined in before the massive gate and sat as if listening. One of the gate men stood, drawing his bow and sighting on the breast of the leading rider. Even as Dernoth leaped forward, leaped toward him, seeing the straining lines on the guardsman's face, his desperate eye, there came a loud pounding from below. Dernoth caught the bow arm and forced it up. The arrow spat forth and out into the windy darkness over the town. By the good God, open your door. Nope, sorry. By the good God, open your door, a man shouted, and once more a spear butt was thumped against the timbers. It was a rimmersman voice, with an edge, almost Dernoth thought of madness. Are you all asleep? Let us in. I am Izorn, Iskrimner's son, escaped from the hand of our enemies. Look, see how the clouds break. Don't you think that is a hopeful sign, Velagas? As he spoke, Duke Leobardus swung his pointing hand in a broad arc to the cabin's open window, nearly smacking his mailed arm against the head of his sweating squire in the process. The squire ducked, swallowing a silent oath as he juggled the duke's greaves, and turned to cuff a young page who had not gotten out of his way fast enough. The page, who had been trying to make himself as unobtrusive as possible in the ship's crowded cabin, renewed his desperate efforts to shrink out of sight entirely. Perhaps we are, in some way, the thin end of the wedge that will put an end to this madness. Leobardus clanked to the window, his squire scrambling along the floor behind him, struggling to hold a half-fastened greave in place. The gravid sky did indeed show long, rippled streaks of blue, as if Cranhir's dark and bulky cliffs, looming over the bay where Leobardus's flagship, Emetin's jewel, rolled at close anchor, caught and tore at the lowering clouds. Velagus, a great round man in golden escritorial robes, stumped to the window to stand at the duke's side. How, my lord, can throwing oil on the fire help to extinguish it? It is, if you would, pardon my forwardness, folly to think so. The hammering of the mustard drum echoed across the water. Leobardus bl brushed lank white hair out of his eyes. I know how the lector feels, he said, and I know he directs you, beloved Iscritor, to try and persuade me out of this. His sacredness is love of peace. Well, it is admirable, but it will not come about by talking. Velagus opened a small brass casket and shook out a sugar sweet, which he delicately placed on his tongue. This is perilously close to sacrilege, Duke Leobardus. Is prayer, talking, 
is the intercession of his sacredness. The lector Ranesin, somehow of less validity than the force of your armies? Oh, if that is so, then our faith in the word of Osiris and of his first acolyte, Sutrines, is a mockery. The Ascriter sighed heavily and sucked. The Duke's cheeks pinkened. He waved the squire away, bending creakily to fasten the last buckle himself, then waved for his surcoat of rich blue with a benedriving kingfisher gold blazoned on the chest. God bless me, Belagas, he said testily, but I haven't a mind for arguing with you today. I, I have been pushed too far by the high king, Elias, and now I must do what is needed. But you do not go into battle by yourself, the large man said, speaking with some heat for the first time. You lead hundreds, nay, thousands of men, of souls, and their well-being is in your care. The seeds of catastrophe are fluttering in the wind, and Mother Church has a responsibility to see they do not find fertile soil. Leobardus shook his head sadly as the small page shyly lifted his golden helmet with its crest of blue-dyed horsehair. Fertile soil is everywhere these days, Viragas, and catastrophe is already growing, if you'll forgive my theft of your poetic words. The thing is, we must try and nip it while it is budding. Come, he patted the escriter's fleshy arm. It is time to go down to the landing boat. Walk with me. Certainly, my good duke, certainly. Belagas turned slightly to the side to ease through the narrow doorway. You will forgive me if I do not accompany you ashore just yet. I have been somewhat unsteady on my legs of late. I am getting old, I fear. Ah, but your rhetoric has not lost its vigor, Leobardus replied as they moved slowly across the deck. A small figure, wrapped in a dark robe, crossed his path, pausing to nod briefly, hands folded on its breast. The Ascritor frowned, but Duke Leobardus returned the nod with a smile. Nin Reisu has been with Imetin's jewel a long time, he said, and she is the finest of sea watchers. I forgive her the formalities. Niskis are strange folk anyway. Well, I guess as you would know if you were a sailing man. Come, my boat is this way. The harbor wind made of Leobardus's cloak a sail, billowing blue against the uncertain sky. Leobardus saw his young, youngest son, Varelin, waiting at landfall, looking too small to fill out his gleaming armor. His thin face peered anxiously from the hollow of his helmet while he surveyed the gathering Nibani forces, as his father might hold him responsible for any slipshod formations among the milling, swearing soldiers. Several of them pushed past him as unconcernedly as if he were the drummer boy, cursing cheerfully, <coughs> cursing cheerfully at a pair of horses, who... Frightened by the confusion, had leaped off the gangplank into the shallow water, taking their handler with them. Varelin backed away from the splashing, whinnying chaos, his forehead wrinkled in a frown that did not go away even when he saw the duke step from the grounded boat and wade the last few paces to the rocky shore of Hernestir's south coast. "'My lord,' he said, and hesitated, Leobardus guessed he was wondering whether to climb down from his horse and bend a knee. The duke had to restrain a scowl. He blamed Nesalanta for the boy's timidity, since she had hung on to him as a drunkard to his, to his jug, unwilling to admit that the last of her children was grown. Of course, he perhaps owned some responsibility himself. He should never have poked fun at the boy's half-formed interest in the priesthood. Still, that had been years ago, and there was no turning the boy's path now. He would be a soldier if it killed him. So, Varelin, he said, and looked around. Well then, my son, it looks as though all is in good order. Although the evidence of his eyes told him his father was either mad or overkind, the young man flashed a grateful smile. 
We shall be unshipped in two hours, I, I would say. Will we march tonight? After a week at sea, the men would kill us both and find a new ducal family. Although I suppose they would have to dispatch Benigaris too if they wanted to finish our line. Speaking of your brother, why is he not here? He spoke lightly, but he found the absence of his eldest child irritating. After weeks of bitter argument over whether Naban should cling to neutrality and a stormy reaction to the Duke's decision to support Joshua, Benigaris had turned his coat and announced his desire to ride with his father and the armies. Benigaris could not give up an opportunity to lead the legions of the Kingfisher in battle, the Duke felt sure, even if it meant giving up a chance to rest his hawks for a short while on the throne of the Sanselin Maestravis. Leobardus realized he was wool-gathering. No, no, Varelin, we must give the men a night in Cran here. Although merrymaking may prove scarce with Luth's war gone so poorly to the north. Where did you say Benigaris was? Varelin colored. I didn't, my lord. I'm sorry. He rode up to the town with his friend, Count Espitus Previs. Leobardus ignored his son's discomfort. By the tree, I would not have thought it too much to expect my son and heir to meet me. Well, so, let us go and see how things are with our other commanders. He snapped his fingers, and the squire brought the duke's horse up, harness bells jingling. They found Mylan Sa in Gadaris, underneath his house's white and red albatross banner. The old man, who had been Leobardus' cordial enemy for years, hailed the duke over. He and Varellen sat watching as Mylan oversaw the final unloading of his two carracks, then joined the old earl in his striped tent for a flagon of sweet and gadarene wine. After talking marching squares and futuring, and putting up with Varellen's half-successful attempts to join in, Leobardus thanked Earl Mylan for his hospitality and went out youngest son trailing behind. Taking the reins back from their squires, they continued on through the bustling encampment, paying brief courtesy visits to the camps of some of the other nobles. The pair had just turned about to ride back up the strand when the duke caught sight of a familiar figure on a big-chested roan charger sauntering down the road from town with another rider at his side. Benigaris's silver armor, his most cherished possession, was so thick with engravings and costly tracings of Ilonite inlay that light declined to reflect from it properly, making it appear almost gray. Corseted by his breastplate, which corrected the overabundancy of his figure, Benigaris looked every inch a brave knight. Young Espitus, beside him, also wore armor of beautiful workmanship, the family osprey crest had been inlaid on his breastplate in mother of pearl. He wore no surcoat that might have covered it up, but went, like Benigaris, plated all over like a gleaming crab. Benigaris said something to his companion. Aspidus Previs laughed, then rode away. Benigaris came down the road, crunching across the gravelly beach toward his father and younger brother. That was Count Aspitus, was it not? Leobardus asked, trying to keep the bitterness he felt in the back of his throat from his voice. Is the Praven House now become our enemy that he cannot come and salute his duke? Benigaris looked, leaned over his saddle and patted his horse's neck. Leobardus could not see if he looked up through his thick, dark brows. I told Aspitus that you and I would speak privately, father. He would have come, but I sent him away. He went out of respect for you. He turned to Varellen, who looked aswim in his bright armor, and gave the boy a brief nod. Feeling slightly overbalanced, the duke changed the subject. What took you to town, my son? News, sire. I thought a spite, since he has been here before, might help me to gather useful tidings. You were gone a long time. Leobardus could not summon the strength to be angry. What did you find, Benigaris? Anything? 
nothing we had not already heard from the Avengate boats. Luth is wounded and has fallen back to the mountains. Skali controls Harness Adhark, but has not the armies to extend himself any farther, not until the Hernister men in the Grandspog have been subdued. So the coast is yet free, and all the ground at this side of the Aksamrath, Nad Mulek, Kumni, all the river lands up to Innis Creek. Leobardus rubbed his head, squinting at the glaring streak the sun made on the surface of the ocean. Perhaps we could best serve Prince Josua if we were to break this nearer siege. If we were to bring our two thousand men against Scali's sharp noses back, Luth's armies would be freed up, what's left of them, and Elias's back would be naked as he lays siege to the Naglamut. He weighed the plan and liked it. It seemed to him something his brother Camaris might have done, swift, forceful, a stroke like a snapping whip. Camaris had always approached warfare like the pure weapon he was, as straightforward and unhesitating as a shining hammer. Benegaris was shaking his head, something like real alarm on his face. Oh, no, sire, no. Why, if we were to do that, all Scali would have to do is melt into the Kirkoil, or climb up into the same Grinspog Mountains. Then we would be pegged down like a stretched hide, waiting for the Rimmer's men to come out. Meanwhile, Elias would reduce Naglimund and be free to turn on us. We would be cracked like a hazelnut between the High King and the Raven. He shook his head emphatically as if the idea frightened him. Leobardus turned away from the dazzling sun. I suppose you make good sense, Benegaris. Although I seem to remember you arguing differently not long ago, that was until you made your decision to put the army in the field, my lord. Benegaris lifted his helmet and rolled it in his hands for a moment before hanging it back on his pommel. Now that we are committed, I am a Nascadu lion. Leobardus took a deep breath. The tang of war was in the air, and it was a scent that filled him with unease and regret. Still, the sundering of Ostenard after the long years of John's peace, the High King's ward, seemed to have brought his headstrong son back to his side. It was something for which to be grateful, however insignificant in the tide of greater events. The Duke of Naban offered a silent prayer of thanks to his confusing, but ultimately beneficent, God. And before I start the next section, I'm just curious if I can get the focus back on this thing, so don't pay any attention to me for a moment while I try and figure out why it's doing this. It's always something, isn't it? It's kind of fascinating. Now it doesn't want to pull the focus back. Who knows? Anyway, um, I'm not going to mess with it anymore for fear of losing it entirely. Next section. Praise you, Cyrus Adon, for bringing you back to us, as Grimner said, and felt tears coming again. He leaned over the bed and gave Izorn's shoulder a rough, joyful shake, earning a sharp glance from Gutrin, who had not left her grown son's side since he had come in the night before. Izor, no stranger to his mother's stern ways, grinned weakly up at his Grimner. He had the duke's blue eyes and broad features, but much of the sheen of youth seemed to have vanished since his father had seen him last. He was drawn, shadowed. Something seemed to have been drained from him for all his stock-shouldered bulk. It's just hardship and worry that's been at him, the duke decided. He's a strong boy. Look at him, how he puts up with his mother's fussing. He'd be a fine man. No, he is a fine man. When he's duke after me, after we send Scully shouting down to hell. Izorn! A new voice sent the errant thought fluttering away. It is a miracle to have you back among us. Prince Joshua leaned forward and clasped Izorn's hand with his own left hand. 
Gutrin nodded approvingly. She did not rise to curtsy to the prince, motherhood apparently overriding manners on this occasion, but Joshua did not seem to mind. The devil, it's a miracle, his Grimner said gruffly and frowned to keep his swelling heart from causing him any embarrassment. He got him out through wits and courage, and that's God's truth. This Grimner? Gutrin warned him. Joshua laughed. Of course. Let me say then, Izorn, that your courage and wit were miraculous. Izorn sat higher in the bed, readjusting the bandaged leg that lay pillowed atop the coverlet like the relic of a saint. That's far too kind, your highness. Had not some of Scali's Kaltzkreik men been without the stomach for torture of, of their fellows, we would be there still, as ice-stiffened corpses. Ice on, his mother said annoyed. Do not speak of such things. It flies in the face of God's mercy. But it's true, mother. Scali's own ravens gave us the knives that permitted our escape. He turned to Joshua. There are dark things afoot in Elvitsala. Over all of Rimmersgard, Prince Joshua, you must believe me, Scali is not alone. The town was full of black Rimmersmen out of the lands around Stormspike. It was them that Sharp Nose left to guard us. It was those God cursed monsters who tortured our men for nothing. We had nothing to hide from them. They did it for pleasure, if such a thing can be imagined. Nights, we went to sleep hearing the cries of our fellows, wondering who they would take next. He moaned softly and lifted his hand from Gutrin's restraining grasp to rub at his temples, as if to scour the memory. Even, even Scully's own men found it sickening. I... I think they are beginning to wonder what their thane has gotten them into. We believe you, Joshua said gently. The look he lifted to standing as Grimner was etched with worry. But there were others, others too, ones who came by night, hooded in black. Even our guards did not see their faces. Although Izorn's voice remained quiet, his eyes were round in the remembering. They did not even move like men. The Adon be my witness. They were out of the cold wastes beyond the mountains. We could feel the chill of them as they passed our prison. We were more frightened of being near to them than of all the black Rimmersmen's hot irons. Izorn shook his head and lay back on the pillow. I, I, I am sorry, Father, Prince Joshua. I am very tired. He is a strong man, is Grimner, the prince said as they walked up the padded, puddled corridor. The roof here was leaking, as so many were in Naglamond after a winter of hard weather and a spring and summer of the same. I only wish I had not left him alone to face that horse and scally. Be damned! Skidding on the wet stone as Grimner cursed his age and clumsiness. He did all that could be done, uncle. You should be proud of him. I am. They walked on for a while before Joshua spoke. I must confess, having eyes on here makes it easier for me to ask of you what I must ask. His Grimner tugged at his beard. And what is that? A boon? One I would not beg if... He hesitated. No. Let us go to my chamber. This is a thing that should be discussed in solitude. He hooked his right arm through the duke's elbow, the leather-capped stump on his wrist a mute reproach in advance of any rejection. His Grimner tugged at his beard again until it hurt. He had a feeling he would not like what he was about to hear. By the tree, let's get a jug of wine to take with us, Joshua. I sorely need it. For the love of you, Cyrus, by the crimson mallet of Draw, the bones of St. Elstan and St. Skendi, are you mad? Why should I leave Naglemund? His Grimner trembled in surprise and anger. 
I would not ask it if there were any other way, is Grimner. The prince spoke patiently, but even through the mist of his rage the duke could see the anguish Jaswa felt. I have lain awake two nights without sleep, trying to think of another way. I cannot. Somebody must find the princess Miriamel. His Grimner took a long swallow of wine, feeling some dribble down his beard, but not caring. Why? he said at last, and set the jar down with a table-rattling thump. And why me? God damn it all! Why me? The prince was all strained patience. She must be found because she is vitally important, as well as my only niece. What if I die, is Grimner? What if we hold off Elias, break the siege, but I stop an arrow or tumble from the castle wall? Who will the people rally behind? Not just the barons and the warlords, but the common people, those who came flocking into my walls for protection. It will be hard enough to fight Elias with me at your head, strange and fickle as I am thought. But what if I die? His Grimner stared at the floor. There is Luth and Leobardus. Joswa shook his head harshly. King Luth is wounded, maybe dying. Leobardus is the Duke of Naban at, at war with Erkenland within the memory of some. The Sanselin itself is a reminder of a time when Naban ruled all. Even you, uncle, good and much respected man as you are, could not hold a force together that would stand against Elias. He is a son of Prester John. He was raised to the dragonbone chair by John himself. For all his wicked deeds, it will take someone from the family to unseat him, and you know it. His Grimner's long silence was his answer. But, but why me? He said at last. Because Miriamel would not come back for anyone else I could send. Dernoth? He is as brave and as loyal as a hunting hawk, but he would have to carry the princess back to Naglamund in a sack. Beside myself, you are the only one who could ever bring her unresisting, and she must come willingly, for it would be disaster if you were found out. Soon enough Elias may discover she is gone, and then he will set the south afire to find her. Joswa walked to his desk and absently ruffled a stack of parchments. Think carefully, Miss Grimner. Forget for a moment that it is yourself we speak of. Who else has traveled as far and has as many friends in strange places? Who else, if you will forgive me, has seen the wrong end of so many dark alleys in Ansis Pelope and, and Naban itself? Miss Grimner, sorry, let me read that last sentence again. Who else, if you will forgive me, has seen the wrong end of so many dark alleys in Ansus Pelope and Naban. His Grimner grinned sourly, in spite of himself. But still it makes no sense, Joswa. How can I leave my men with Elias coming against us? And how could I hope to perform such a secret thing, well known as I am? For the first, that is why it seems to me a sign from God that Izorn has come. Ein Skalder, we both would agree, is not the restraint to command. Izorn does. Anyway, uncle, he deserves the chance to make good. Elvritzala's fall has battered his young pride. It's battered pride that makes a boy a man, the duke growled. Go on. As to the second... Well, you are well known, but you have been seldom south of Erkenland in twenty years. In any case, we shall disguise you. Disguise? His Grimner pawed distractedly at the braids of his beard as Joshua walked to his chamber door and called out. The Duke had a strange, heavy feeling around his heart. He had been dreading the fighting, not so much for himself as for his people, his wife, now his son was here too, giving him another stone of worry to carry. 
But to leave, even riding into danger as great as he left behind, it seemed insupportably like cowardice, like treason. But I was sworn to Joshua's father. My dear old John, how can I not do what his son asks? And his arguments make all too much be damned sense. Here, the prince said, stepping away from the door to allow someone in. It was Father Strangyard, his pink, eye-patched face creased in a shy smile. Tall frame stooped over his burden, a bundle of dark cloth. I, I hope it fits, he said. They seldom do. I, I don't know why. Just another gentle reminder, another of the master's little burdens. He trailed off, then seemed to find the thread again. Eglaf was most kind to lend it. He is about your size, I think, although not quite so tall. Eglaf, his Grimner said, mystified. Who is Eglaf? Joshua, what is this nonsense? Brother Eglaf, of course, Strangyard explained. Your disguise is Grimner, Joshua amplified. The castle archivist shook out the bundle revealing a woolen set of black priestly vestments. You are a devout man, uncle, the prince said. I am sure you will be able to carry it off. The duke could have sworn Joshua was resisting a smile. What? Priest's robes? His Grimner was beginning to see the outlines of the thing, and he was not pleased. How better to pass unnoticed in Naban, where Mother Church is queen, and... Priests of every stripe nearly outnumber the rest of the citizens. Joshua was smiling. His Grimner was furious. Joshua, I feared for your wits before, but now I know you have lost them completely. This is the maddest scheme I have ever seen. And on top of everything else, who ever heard of an Adenite priest with a beard? He snorted scornfully. The prince with a warning glance to Father Strangyard, who put the robes down on a chair and back toward the door, walked to his table and lifted a cloth, revealing a basin of hot water and a gleaming, fresh-stropped razor. His Grimner's eruptive bellow rattled the very crockery in the castle kitchen below. Okay. Next section. Speak... Mortal men, do you come to our hills as spies? A chilly silence followed Prince Jeriki's words. From the corner of his eye, Simon watched Haystan reach backward, feeling along the wall for something to use as a weapon. Sludig and Grimrick glared at the Scythi who surrounded them, certain that at any moment they would be set upon. No, Prince Jeriki. Binnevik said hastily. Surely you are seeing we had no expectations of finding your people here. We are from Naglamon. Prince Joshua's sending on an errand of terrible import. We are seeking... The troll hesitated as though afraid to say too much. Finally, with a shrug, he continued. We... We go to the Dragon Mountain for searching... Camaris Savinita's sword, Thorn. Jeriki narrowed his eyes, and behind him the green-clad one he had called his uncle let out a thin whistle of breath. What would you do with such a thing? Kendrajaro demanded. Binibic would not answer this, but stared unhappily at the cavern floor. The very air seemed to thicken as the moments passed. It's to save us from... Inaluki, the Storm King, Simon blurted out. None of the Scythi moved a muscle except to blink. No one said a word. Speak more, Jeriki said at last. If we must, Bitterbeck said. It is part of a story near as long as your Wakiza Tumetai Nerianis, the Song of the Fall of Tumetai. We will try for telling you what we can. The troll hurriedly explained the main facts. 
It seemed to Simon that he deliberately omitted many things. Once or twice in the telling, Binnebeck looked up and caught his eye, seemingly warning him to silence. Binnebeck told the silent Sithy of Naglaman's preparations and the crimes of the High King. He explained the words of Yarnauga and the Book of Nisses, reciting the rhyme that led them on towards Urmsheim. The finish of the story left the troll facing Jeriki's bland stare, the uncle's more skeptical expression, and a silence so complete that the ringing echo of the waterfall seemed to swell until it filled the whole cavern with noise. What a place of madness and dreams this was, and what a mad story they were suddenly living in. Simon felt his heart racing, but not from fear alone. This is hard to credit, son of my sister, Kendrajaro said at last, spreading his beringed hands in an unfamiliar gesture. It is, uncle, but I think this is not time to speak of it. But the other one, the boy spoke of, Kendrajaro began, his yellow eyes troubled, his voice full of building anger. The black one below Nakika, not now. There was an edge to the Sithi prince's voice. He turned to the five outsiders. Apologies are called for. It is not good that we should discuss such things. While you still have not eaten, you are our guests. Simon felt a wave of relief at these words and swayed a little, his knees suddenly weak. Noticing this, Jeriki waved them toward the fire. Sit down. We must be forgiven our suspicions. Understand, although I owe you blood debt, Seoman, you are my Hikastaja. Your race has done ours little kindness. I must be disagreeing with you in a part, Prince Jeriki, Benebik replied, seating himself on a flat rock near the fire. Of all Sithi, your family should be knowing that we cannot have never brought you any harm. Jeriki looked down on the little man, and his taut features relaxed into an expression almost of fondness. You have caught me in ungraciousness, Binbinikega Benik. After only the Western men whom we knew best, we once loved the Kanuk well. Binibik lifted his head, a look of astonishment on his round face. How are you knowing my full name? I have not given mention of it, and my companions have not been, either. Jeriki laughed, a hissing sound, but strangely cheering, with not a hint of insincerity. In that moment, Simon felt a fierce, sudden liking for him. Ah, troll, the prince said. Someone as traveled as you are should not be surprised that your name is known. How many Kanuk beside your master and yourself are ever seen south of the mountains? You were knowing my master? He is dead now. Binnebeck pulled off his gloves and flexed his fingers. Simon and the others were finding seats of their own. He knew us, Jeriki said. Did he not teach you to speak our language? You said the troll spoke to you, Anai. He did, my prince, mostly correctly. Binibic flushed, pleased but embarrassed. Okay, Cook was teaching me some, but he never told me where he had been learning it. I had the thought perhaps his master had given it to him. Sit now, sit, said Jeriki, gesturing for Haystan, Sludig, and Grimrick to follow Simon and Binibic's example. They came like dogs who fear a beating and found themselves places near the fire. Several of the other Sithi approached, bearing salvers of intricately carved and polished wood, high laden with all manner of things, butter and dark brown bread, a wheel of pungent salty cheese, small red and yellow fruits that Simon had never seen before. There were also several bowls of quite recognizable berries and even a pile of slow-dripping honeycombs. When Simon reached and took two of the sticky combs, Jeriki laughed again, a quiet sibilance like a jay in a distant tree. Everywhere is winter, 
he said, but in the sheltered fastnesses of Jiaohe Tinukai, the bees do not know it. Take all you like. Captors turned hosts now serve the companions a familiar but potent wine, an unfamiliar but potent wine, filling their wooden goblets from stone ewers. Simon wondered if some prayer might be said before starting, but the Scythi had already begun to eat. Haystan, Sludig, and Grimrick were looking around miserably, wanting to begin but still full of fear and distrust. They watched intently as Binibic broke bread and took a mouthful of buttered crust. Some moments later, when he was not only still alive but eating merrily, the men felt safe to attack the Scythi fair, which they did with the vigor of reprieved prisoners. <clears throat> Dabbing honey from his chin, Simon paused to watch the Scythi. The fair folk ate slowly, sometimes staring at a berry between their fingers for long instants before lifting it to their mouths. There was little speech, but when one of them made some remark in their liquid tongue or gave voice to a brief trill of song, all the others listened. Most often there was no response, but if one of them had some answer, they all listened to that too. There was much quiet laughter, but no shouting and no arguing, and Simon never heard anyone interrupt while another was speaking. Anai had moved over to sit Sim near Simon and Binibic. One of the Scythi made a solemn statement that drew a laugh from the others. Simon asked Anai to explain the joke. The white-jacketed Scytha looked slightly uncomfortable. Kyushapo said that your friends eat as though they fear their food might run away. He gestured to Haystan, who was pushing food into his mouth with both hands. Simon was not sure what Anai meant. Surely they had seen hungry people before, but he smiled anyway. And we're really in the middle of quite a long scene, so I'm not going to try to finish that uh, tonight by any means there's not really any good place to stop so we will assume and hope um uh going checking back on this the comments which as i said i haven't couldn't read while we were going i see a um i i, I see a question from tiffany perry um uh, that is something i'll wait until after i've read that section because that's still probably a couple of weeks ahead at least. Um, so I don't want to answer that question tonight, Tiffany, because some people may have not read this in so long or may not have. Maybe there's some out there who've never read this and are just listening to it for the first time. But I will, if when we get to that section or before we get to that section or somewhere along the line, if you will remind me about your question, um, I will do my best to answer it. I believe that it's uh, one of those, the question itself has something to do with some of the stuff that goes on in the new series. Um, the one that I'm just finishing. So it's actually, uh, it's apropos, I think, of what we're currently working on. Anyway, <coughs> excuse me. With that, I am going to wrap it up for the night. Um, I thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry for all the weirdnesses of technical stuff that we've had lately. I hope everything was at least audible. Um, I seem to be back in focus again. I have no idea what that looks like on your end uh, or if it ever even went out of focus on your end, but it definitely did on mine for a long time. So with that, I say thank you so much for joining me. Uh, be good to yourselves. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones and the folks around you. And I will be back next week and pray God that we will, or pray whatever, that uh, we will be able to get um, the poor 1 a.m. crowd, a proper reading at that point. I will have everything finally figured out. Maybe I can even see comments at the same time. Um, anyway, with that, thank you. Peace, be good, and I will talk to you very soon.